Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Selling Greenville, your favorite real estate podcast here in lovely Greenville, South Carolina. I am your host, as always, Stan McCune, realtor here in Greenville, South Carolina. You can reach me any way you want to, email, uh, phone call, text. My contact information is in the show notes, like you guys always know. And uh, please, if you love this podcast, give it a rating or a review. I I plead with you guys to do that. Please, it takes like literally two seconds. I finally, I'll be honest, one of my favorite podcasts, I just finally left a review for, so I get it. I've been listening to that podcast for years. I get it. It's it's not an easy thing to bring yourself to, to do those two clicks, um, but I would appreciate if you guys could do that. And, and of course, subscribe and download the show um, if you're enjoying these episodes, you want to listen to more. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about, this is just going to be a short episode, I think, unless I go on a rabbit trail. Um, we're going to be talking about um, a very interesting development in the broader mortgage world. This deals with Fannie Mae. So Fannie Mae um, had, was impacted by a treasury amendment recently. And basically, the treasury is trying to limit its exposure to limit its liability when it comes to real estate. So this is a this directly impacts us. When the Treasury does things with Fannie Mae, and, and I'm no expert in all these uh, backdoor uh, economic types of things, but, but my general understanding is that the Treasury has uh, agreements with Fannie Mae in place that involve stock purchasing and that types of, uh, of things with Fannie Mae. Um, and, and it's this kind of convoluted way of the government uh, backing our mortgages. And if you remember back in 2008, that was what brought the crash was uh, the government's involvement in the mortgages uh, was not a positive. Um, there ended up being a lot of shady lending practices that happened because uh Banks were kind of, in essence, they felt like they were guaranteed to get paid back one way or, or the other. Um, and then, well, that ended up not happening. Um, we're not going to get into all of that. But the point is, it's gotten a lot stricter since then, obviously. It got very strict. Um, and then last year, it was very interesting. During COVID, we saw a tightening. Once COVID happened, banks immediately started saying, uh, like I had one bank right away that I've used for for multiple uh, investment properties over the years. They said we are not doing any more loans on any investment properties. We're not owner occupants only. You know, maybe some commercial, uh, some commercial deals, but nothing on rental properties. And that was crazy. Uh, that was shocking to me. I mean, this wasn't even um, you know midway through the year that they heard this. And and you have to understand. Banks, they have a portfolio, so to speak, um, of the loans that they have. They want to have a certain number of these loans, a certain number of these loans, and they all kind of balance out, and it helps them to mitigate risk, but also have potential uh, for reward as well. So some of their loans you know, are, are higher risk, higher reward. Some of their loans, for instance, to just a normal homeowner living you know, in their home with great credit. Um, and getting a low interest rate, those are low risk, low, low reward. So they try to balance it out with, with all these different things. Well, the Treasury is imposing on Fannie Mae uh, a risk uh, measure similar to what the banks did voluntarily last year when they started saying, you know what, we're, we're backing off um, lending for rental properties. And uh, and the main restriction I'm interested in is that there is now a seven percent limit on their acquisition of single family mortgage loans secured by second home and investment properties. In other words, my understanding is that out of the uh, Fannie Mae portfolio, only seven percent of the Fannie Mae portfolio can include mortgages towards second homes and investment properties. Well, that's not a whole lot. That is not a whole lot at all. 7%? Um, and that's going to have a, a, a ripple effect. If you're getting a loan from, you know, if, if, if you're thinking that you're going to get, for instance, a conventional, uh, a conventional type of loan, um, your, pr- 
probably going to be impacted by this at some point. You're going to see banks that also just follow suit, that they see, okay, this is what Fannie Mae is doing. We need to tighten up as well. This indicates to me that the government is looking down the road and they're seeing risk of people purchasing investment properties and going into foreclosure. That is the reality of the situation. They're they're seeing something. I don't know what they're seeing, but they're seeing something that tells them, hey, we need to tighten things up on all these investors. Maybe there's a slew of new investors coming into the market uh, in uh, the past year or so, and they're worried about that. Maybe it's something with COVID. Maybe there's something you know, that they have looked at how many uh, people are behind on their mortgages or how many people took advantage of programs last year and this year where they uh, didn't have to make their mortgage payments or whatever the case. And they're looking at that and they're saying, oh man, we're going to, we're about to have a lot of people uh, in a world of trouble. Who knows? I, I, I don't know what they're seeing, but they're seeing something that makes them concerned about uh, lending on investment properties and second homes. Um, if you're an investor, that means if you plan to get uh, normal bank financing, and by normal, I mean not hard money, uh, not you know from some kind of credit union, just like a conventional loan or something like that um, to to purchase you know a duplex or a quadruplex or something like that. Um, you're going to potentially run into uh, some struggles with that this year if you wait to the second half of the year. That's what I think is going to happen. They're they're putting this amendment. Um, into motion in April, and we're going to see uh, banks really tighten up from this in terms of what they lend out. Uh, and again, some of them might just tighten up voluntarily, even if they're not uh, dealing with a Fannie Mae type of loan, just because they're concerned about what the government's seeing. Why is the government doing this? What is what what's going on behind closed doors? We're just going to follow suit as well, and voluntarily do that. This also makes me wonder, what are they seeing? Of course, I mean, that that's what everyone wants to know. Are we about to see a flood of foreclosures come into the market? That would be a very interesting phenomenon for sure. And I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but I think that we're in a situation here where, where maybe there is something to this idea that uh, maybe a year or two from now, we are going to see, you know, these investors that um, that purchase properties for the first time because interest rates were low and they were um, really eager to to buy in, and they're going to all of a sudden find out, oh man, um, I, I can't afford my my mortgage anymore, um, and maybe they get a few months behind, and of course the foreclosure process takes a while. Um, but we, we could very well, I could very well see that happening and see us in a couple of years having a little uh, run on foreclosures. Who knows? That is probably the most likely scenario whereby, at least the way things currently are, whereby we would see the market flip from the insane seller's market that is right now into more of a buyer's market. Um, I, I don't see, again, I don't see that happening uh, you know, anytime soon, but could it happen in a couple of years? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely could. And I will say this: I see pe- people all the time purchasing uh, duplexes. Duplexes are are an easy one to to look at because most of the time, people buy duplexes. They're not living in them. Almost always, they're renting out both sides of the duplex, and you can get a you can pretty easily extrapolate what a duplex is going to rent for. I mean, we've got pretty standard rental rates for for multifamily properties in this area. It's pretty it's pretty predictable. And um, I see all the time people purchasing uh, duplexes and properties like that for prices that I know their cash on cash return is either really low or, they have a loan on that property, and and that loan, um, combined with the property taxes and everything else, they are probably not matching uh, in terms of the the income that they bring in, their expenses. They're probably losing money on those properties. Well, 
what's going to happen over time those people are going to need to get out they're they're going to realize that uh that they need to get out of those properties and some people will learn that before it's too late and they'll put their property for sale and and sell it um but the thing that people are assuming is that home values are going to continue to go up at the clip that they have um and that might be a faulty assumption as well particularly when you're talking about investment types of properties um if you buy a duplex and the purchase price you pay for it makes it to where there's no way it can cash flow unless the price of rent goes up quite a bit you know in in the future uh in future years how do you think that you're going to then turn around and sell that duplex for significantly more than what you paid for it it's tricky because rental properties appreciate in a different way than owner occupied primary residences appreciate they they you know primary residences appreciate um just pretty formulaically but rental properties their appreciation is both a or it's a combination of of several different things it's a combination of the area it's a combination of if they're in a transitional area, is that transitional area Im- improving at a faster clip than uh, than other areas? Um, what rent are they bringing in? You know, if you can take a rental property, one of the one of the best strategies for adding value to a property, get a rental property, purchase a rental property from someone that hasn't raised rents in 15, 20 years. Their tenants are paying three fifty a month. Um, and the property is in disrepair, you can repair the property and maybe you can get rents up to seven or 800 a month. I've seen this happen. Well, you have just added a ton of value, value far beyond just the repairs that you did. Now you've made that rental property much more valuable just based on the cash flow. Um, so, so they appreciate in a different way. At some point, the cash flow becomes more important than the area, to be completely honest, for, for some of these properties that are particularly multifamily, that are uniquely going to be uh, second homes and investment properties. Now, if it's just a single family home, it's it's not quite the same. A, a standard single family home, um, even if it's used as a rental property, will be less pegged to how much rent money it's bringing in. Um, but, uh, but for a lot of us, multifamily, um, is really the best way to, uh, to cash flow rental properties in this market, but you have to be careful because we're seeing these warning signs now that maybe there will be some, uh, landlords that get in over their heads. You don't want to be one of them, obviously. Um, additionally, however, you might find yourself in a situation here in a few years where maybe there is an influx of opportunities. There's not a lot of opportunities right now to purchase uh, these good multifamily properties, to purchase these good inve- these good rental properties. You have to be very selective. Maybe a few years from now, we're going to find that people got in over their heads, um, which is not a good thing. I'm not celebrating that. Um, but just being realistic, just being honest here, maybe that will open up the door for some more opportunities for investors. We don't know. There's more questions than answers when it comes to why Fannie Mae is doing this, but I think it's an important development. It's an important consideration. It is going to impact people this year. It will impact them. We already saw it impact them last year to an extent, as I already said, but now um, Fannie Mae tightening things is going to cause everyone to tighten things a little bit more than they did even last year. So keep that in mind as you're game planning for the year. It may become difficult for you to get financing on investment properties the second half of this year. I could totally see that happening. Or it could be month to month. Some of these uh, banks, they may look at it month to month and they may say, okay, this month we're not taking any more. Next month we'll reevaluate whether we want to take on more loans on, uh, on rental properties. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to respond to this. It's 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 kind of uncharted waters uh, to a certain extent. Um, it, it's a it's a strict response, in my opinion, to whatever it is that the Treasury is seeing, uh, and so we'll just have to monitor it. I just know last year 
Second half of last year, I had an awful time uh, getting financing on a couple of properties that I wanted financing on that, that were rental properties. Um, that said, I was finally able to pull it off with a few headaches. Um, and so uh, that's something that I can help you guys with as well. If, if you do run into a situation where you're struggling with getting financing, you're probably looking too conventional. You're probably just you know, looking at the wrong banks. Usually there's someone out there um, at least until the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter can get a little dicey, but at least through the third quarter, there's usually someone out there that uh, is willing to finance uh, investment properties if the numbers make sense. And so I can help you guys with that. That's part of what I do. Part of the value that I provide is that I've networked and worked with all these lenders uh, in a lot of different spaces over the years. And I can help you guys out with that. Out with that. I don't know what just happened to my throat. <laughs> I can help you guys out with that as you need it. Just let me know. All of my contact information, as always, is in the show notes. That's it. Short episode today. I just wanted to bring this to you guys to your attention because I think that this is something we don't have all the answers to it yet, but it's an important thing to follow. But you can reach out to me for any reason with my contact information in the show notes. Please go ahead and give the show a rating, a review, hit the subscribe button. I appreciate all my fans out there. I appreciate you guys. Thank you once again for listening. I hope you have a great rest of the week.